I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the fourth chapter of the OpenStax Psychology textbook. Today we'll be discussing states of consciousness and asking questions like, what is consciousness? What is sleep and why do we sleep? What are the stages of sleep? What are sleep problems and disorders? What about substance use and abuse and other states of consciousness? But let's get started by asking, what is consciousness? Well, we regularly experience different states of consciousness or awareness of internal and external stimuli. So sleep is a state of relatively low levels of activity and sensory awareness, while wakefulness is characterized by high levels of sensory awareness, thought, and behavior. Biological rhythms are internal rhythms of biological activity. Now, body temperature fluctuates cyclically over a 24-hour period, and your alertness is higher um, with a higher body temperature, and you sleep with a lower body temperature. And this is why you shouldn't be driving at 3 a.m. Your body temperature is lower, and you're more likely to fall asleep and get in a terrible accident. This pattern is what's called a circadian rhythm. The hypothalamus is in charge of homeostasis in the body, and the SCN in the hypothalamus, I'm not gonna to try to pronounce that, in the hypothalamus helps keep the body's clock synced with the outside world. Now it's interesting because years ago they did studies where they had people live in total darkness all the time, uh, like in a cave, uh, with artificial light though, so they could turn a light on when they wanted. And they found that those people migrated to a 25 hour day, but the research was judged to be faulty because they let people turn the lights on whenever they wanted to. So the best current research says uh, that people, which means adults, uh, prefer a day of 24 hours and 11 minutes, plus or minus 16 minutes. Melatonin is a hormone that is important for the sleep wake cycle, and it's released by the pineal gland, which is thought to be involved in the regulation of various biological rhythms and of the immune system during sleep. Melatonin is, release is triggered by darkness and inhibited by light, which is one of the reasons why it's related to sleep. Sleep regulation is the brain's control of switching between sleep and wakefulness. And it also has to coordinate this cycle with the outside world in what's happening in your life. So jet lag results from the mismatch between internal circadian rhythms in our environment. So for example, flying to Europe from here where I'm at is an eight hour difference and that can lead to insomnia, fatigue, sluggishness, and irritability, especially after a day of walking around Paris. Rotating shift work refers to a work schedule that changes from early to late on a daily or weekly basis. So you have, might have three different shifts, shifts, so a day shift from seven to three in the afternoon, and then a swing shift from three to 11, and a night shift from 11 to seven. Now people can get used to these shifts, but the problem is when they're rotating. So if you swing, go from a day shift to a swing shift to a night shift, to a day shift, to a swing shift, to a night shift, it can real, uh, cause real sleep disruptions. Bright lights or light therapy are sometimes used to help alleviate the symptoms of jet lag or rotating shift work. Sleep debt occurs when a person does not get, get enough sleep on a chronic basis. Decreased alertness and mental efficiency are consequences of sleep debt. And sleep deprivation also frequently leads to depression-like symptoms and is also associated with obesity, increased blood pressure, increased stress, and a reduced immune response. And you can see to the right there the sleep needs of people at various uh, ages. And so at 18 and older, you should be getting seven to nine hours of sleep. I cannot think of the last time that I got nine hours of sleep though. Sleep rebound is when a sleep deprived individual will tend to take a shorter time falling asleep during subsequent opportunities for sleep. And this is evidence of the homeostatic function of sleep. The brain has specific types of activity during sleep and this can be seen using EEGs. And 
we'll talk about um, the, the sleep stages here in a minute. Some of the areas in, of the brain involved in the sleep-wake cycles include the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the pons. Now, the pineal gland, it releases melatonin during sleep, and the pituitary gland secretes growth hormone during sleep also. So why do we sleep? It's not proven exactly why we sleep, but there are several hypotheses um, to explain it. And I want you to keep in mind about this too. Uh, if you live into your mid seventies, then you're gonna have spent 25 of those years asleep. So please buy a comfortable mattress, get a good night's sleep. Evolutionary uh, psychology talks, uh, and it's, it's a discipline that studies how universal patterns of behavior and cognitive processes have evolved over time as a result of natural selection. This isn't the first time we've talked about evolutionary psychology. But they're interested in the adaptive function of sleep. So why do we sleep? Uh, one argument is that sleep is needed to restore resources that are used during the day. So there's no research to support this. And this used to be called the body restitution hypothesis. But uh, yeah. Another theory is that sleep patterns have evolved as an adaptive response to predator risks, which increase in the darkness. So if you're not out stumbling around in the dark, you don't get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, uh, or you don't injure yourself, and then you can't get back home. Uh, part of this, or one part of this theory too, is that basically we're descended from people who slept. Uh, people who didn't sleep got eaten and failed to reproduce, and so they're not our ancestors. The cognitive function of sleep. Well, sleep is important for cognitive function and memory formation. Sleep, sleep deprivation leads to disruptions in cognition and memory deficits. Cognitive benefits of sleep include increased capacities for creative thinking, language learning, and inferential judgments. Also, the processing of emotional information is influenced by sleep. Sleep includes different stages that are differentiated by patterns of brain activity. So the two general stages of sleep are REM and non-REM sleep. Rapid eye movement or REM sleep includes darting movements of the eyes under closed eyelids. The brain waves resemble the brain waves uh, that are, you can see during people being awake. Non-REM sleep is divided into four stages, which are the first four stages of sleep. The fifth and final sleep stage of sleep is REM sleep. But let's start by talking about stages one and two. Stage one sleep is a transitional phase between wakefulness and sleep. It includes alpha and then theta waves. Alpha waves are low frequency, high amplitude, and theta waves have even lower frequency and higher amplitude. The brain activity during stage one sleep resembles someone who's very relaxed but awake, and it's easy to wake somebody from stage one sleep, and they may not even have thought that they were asleep. Stage, in stage two sleep, the body goes into a state of deep relaxation, and it's characterized by theta waves interrupted by sleep spindles and K-complexes. A sleep spindle is a rapid burst of high-frequency brain waves, and sleep spindles might be important for learning and memory. And a K-complex is a very high amplitude pattern of brain activity due to environmental stimuli. And K-complex, um, they may serve as a bridge to higher levels of arousal. Stage three and four sleep are made up of delta waves, which are low frequency, high amplitude waves. During these stages, the heart rate and respiration decrease, and it's much more difficult to wake someone during stage three or four sleep. REM sleep includes rapid movements of the eyes and dreams. Brain waves, um, as I said earlier, are similar to when a person is awake when they're in REM sleep. It's often called paradoxical sleep to the, due to the high brain activity and the paralysis of muscle systems in the body. You can also experience what's called REM rebound. If people are deprived of REM sleep, they will spend more time in REM sleep the next night. And this suggests again that REM sleep, like regular sleep, is homostatically regulated. Now, sleep deprivation is bad, 
But REM deprivation doesn't seem to be that bad. Many antidepressant medications actually suppress REM sleep uh, with no negative consequences. What about dreams? Boy, here's something to wade into. Sigmund Freud, and he's pictured there to the right, thought dreams represented unconscious thoughts. He called the manifest content the storyline of the dream, and latent content was the hidden meaning of the dream, or what the dream was really about. Carl Jung, who was a student of Freud's, thought that dreams allowed us to tap into the collective unconscious, and he described the collective unconscious as a theoretical repository of information which Jung believed to be shared by everyone. Now, both of those theories lack empirical support, and there are also theories about lucid dreaming, which is where people know that they're dreaming and can control the dream's content. There are even classes that you can take in lucid dreaming, but um, yeah, there's not much empirical or research support for any of this. Between 30 to 50% of people suffer from a sleep disorder at some point in their lives. So let's start by talking about insomnia. And this is a consistent difficulty in falling or staying asleep. The criteria for it is that at least three nights a week for at least one month, you have a consistent difficulty in falling or staying asleep. People who have insomnia experience increased levels of anxiety about their inability to sleep, which makes it harder to sleep. So it becomes this self-perpetuating cycle. Anxiety leads to sleep difficulties, which make it harder to sleep, which makes people more anxious, which makes it more difficult for them to fall asleep, and on and on. The treatments for it, um, people are told to limit their use of stimulant drugs, so don't drink coffee. Personally, I don't drink coffee after five o'clock or I would have problems falling asleep. And people should increase their exercise during the day so they'll be tired when it's time to go to sleep. Cognitive behavioral therapy has also proven to be effective and uh, it's known as CBT. CBT includes stress management techniques and changes to problematic behavior. So for example, don't read or watch TV in bed. Parasonomias, I'm not saying that right. These are unwanted disruptive motor activity during sleep, such as sleepwalking or somnambulism. This is when the sleeper engages in complex behaviors while asleep. Now that could mean wandering around or it could mean even driving a car. They have their eyes open, but they're not responsive to communication. REM sleep behavior disorder, or RBD, is um, when the muscle paralysis associated with REM sleep doesn't occur. And so they have a high level of physical activity, such as kicking, punching, yelling, scratching, etc., and they can injure themselves or their sleep partners. And uh, REM uh, RBD is treated with colonzepam alone or sometimes in conjunction with melatonin. Restless leg syndrome is uncomfortable sensations in the legs during uh, inactivity, and that's relieved by moving the legs, but people who have this have difficulty falling and staying asleep. It's usually associated with a number of other medical diagnoses like chronic kidney disease and diabetes, or diabetes if you wanna say it like Wilford Brimley does. Night terrors are a sense of panic accompanied by screams and attempts to escape Generally, treatment is unnecessary for night terrors unless there's an underlying medical or psychological condition that's contributing to them. Sleep apnea is when a sleeper's breathing stops. Individuals who are sleeping don't notice these episodes, but they do notice more fatigue. And sleep apnea is more common in overweight people and it's associated with very loud snoring two types of sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is when an individual's airway becomes blocked and the air does not enter their lungs. And central sleep apnea is disruptions in signals sent from the brain that regulate breathing. The treatment of sleep apnea is the continuous positive airway pressure device, which you can see in the picture. So you just sleep with it on, basically with a sleep mask on. 
SIDS, which is, it stands for Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, is when an infant stops breathing during sleep and dies. Individuals younger than 12 months are at the highest risk and boys are at greater risk than girls. There also might be differences in brain structure for children who die from SIDS. The risk factors are things like premature birth, smoking within the home, and hypothermia. What is, what's the solution uh, to help? Um, so infants should sleep on their backs. Their cribs should be free of suffocation threats, so things like blankets and pillows. They should not have caps on their heads, and people should abstain from smoking in the home. It may seem obvious, but recommendations like these have uh, saved lives by reducing the number of SIDS deaths. Narcolepsy is when a person cannot resist falling asleep at inopportune times. Now, their sleep episodes are often associated with cataplexy, which is a lack of muscle tone or muscle weakness, and some cases involve complete paralysis of their voluntary muscles. The episodes can last from one minute to half an hour, and people typically awake feeling refreshed. As you can imagine, narcolepsy is dangerous and can interfere with day-to-day -day life, and it's treated through psychomotor stimulant drugs such as amphetamines, which is a good segue into substance use. So a person who has a substance use disorder uses more of the substance than they originally intended and continues to use the substance despite adverse consequences. So let's talk about a few things here too uh, to get our definitions straight. Physical dependence is changes in normal bodily functions. So the user will experience withdrawal from the drug when they stop using it. Psychological dependence is an emotional need for the drug and the, dr the drug also might help relieve some psychological distress that they have. So that would be considered psychological dependence too. Tolerance is physiological dependence where a person requires more and more of the substance to achieve the previous effects that were experienced at lower doses. So you have to take more of it. And withdrawal are negative symptoms when the drug is discontinued. So let's switch gears a little and start talking about specific drug categories. So uh, depressants are drugs that suppress the central nervous system activity and alcohol is a depressant. Now at low doses, alcohol is associated with feelings of euphoria, but as the dose increases, people feel sedated. Alcohol use is associated with decreases in reaction time, visual acuity, lowered alertness, oh, that's lower visual acuity by the way, and behavior control issues. In pregnant women, alcohol use can lead to FAS, which is fetal alcohol syndrome, or FASD, which is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Now, the abuse potential of depressants is relatively high, probably because alcohol is the only drug with an advertising budget. Stimulants increase overall neural activity. So cocaine agonizes dopamine, the, nope, yeah. it agonizes the dopamine neurotransmitter system. And it does this by blocking the reuptake of dopamine into the neural synapse. Amphetamines also block the reuptake of dopamine. And so you might ask, why are people given amphetamines when they have ADHD? Wouldn't that just make them um, uh, even more stimulated? And uh, what they found is that uh, the increased neurotransmitter activity uh, occurs within areas of the brain associated with impulse control. And so that's why stimulants are given for people with, to people with ADHD. Methamphetamine or meth ha use has certainly increased in the last 20 years. And one of the problems with it is it's made from over-the-counter ingredients, uh, flu medications. Caffeine is considered to be a stimulant. However, it's considered to be relatively safe, which is good because I drink a lot of caffeine. And nicotine is highly addictive and increases the risk of heart disease, stroke, and a variety of cancers, um, primarily because smoking is how you obtain nicotine and smoking is not good for you. Opioids have analgesic properties, which means that they decrease pain. And examples of uh, opioids are things like heroin, morphine, methadone, and codeine. 
Opiates, which are natural opiate, opioids, are derivatives of opium, which naturally occurs in poppy plants. The misuse and abuse of hydrocodone and oxycodone are considered to be significant public health concerns because they're prescription drugs and they're often abused and they're also often overprescribed. Heroin use also increases the risk for tuberculosis in HIV, primarily because uh, the way to take heroin or a way to take heroin is through intravenous injection. Opioid withdrawal is extremely unpleasant and it resembles a severe case of the flu, but it is not life-threatening. Hallucinogens cause profound alterations in sensory and perceptual experiences. So people might have visual hallucinations, altered body sensations where they feel as if they were a giant, and there's a skewed passage of time uh, so that it, time seems to slow down. Those are all common experiences. And examples are mescaline and LSD, and the, they are serotonin agonists. Uh, PCP, which is angel dust, and ketamine, which is special K, are uh, antagonists of the MM, NMDA glutamate receptor. Hallucinogens are not thought to have as much abuse potential, but that's compared to the other drugs that we've been talking about in this section. Hypnosis. Well, hypnosis is a state of extreme self-focus and attention in which minimal attention is given to external stimuli. A clinician might use relaxation and suggestion in an attempt to alter the thoughts and perceptions of a patient. And Sigmund Freud actually used hypnosis with patients early in his career, and then he abandoned it because he didn't think it did anything. Contrary to popular belief, People undergoing hypnosis usually have clear memories of the experience are in and are in control of their own behaviors. So the components of hypnosis are this guided focus on one thing, such as the hypnotist's word or a ticking watch. Individuals are usually directed to be relaxed and sleepy to feel comfortable. Openness to the process of hypnosis, so they trust the hypno hypnotist and they just let go and the use of imagination is encouraged. So how does it work? Well, one theory is that hypnosis is actually dissociation. It's a dissociated state of consciousness, uh, basically because it focuses your attention elsewhere. You're kind of focused on just one thing. And another theory is that, it play, that people who are hypnotized are playing a social role, that essentially they're acting like someone who's hypnotized or what they think someone who's hypnotized would act like. Meditation is the act of focusing on a single target, such as the breath or a repeated sound to increase awareness of the moment. So while hypnosis is usually done with a therapist, a person can do meditation alone. Meditative techniques have their roots in religious practices, but their use has grown in popularity among practitioners of alternative medicine. And research indicates that meditation may help reduce blood pressure and the American Heart Association, Association suggests that meditation might be used in conjunction with more traditional treatments. Well, all your problems can be solved. At least all your APA problems can be solved with my Learn APA style book and tapes. So when you need to learn to write correctly or write right, <laughs> consult my books and videos on Learn APA style which are about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Have a great day and thanks for listening.